Okay, um, we're about to restart, so um, thank you. There are plenty of seats for those who are standing up the back. It's just you might have to squeeze in or climb over or something like that. But, um, okay, so hopefully uh, most of you managed to get some coffee. Remember the way that these conferences work is that if you're dissatisfied with the catering or the facilities or anything like that, um, then you're entitled to a free uh, money-back offer. <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, it's great to see you back and it's also going to be really exciting now because we've got uh, the next uh, visiting keynote speaker uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, work that we're, many of us here are really interested in. It ties in very closely to the national project which I mentioned earlier. Um, and so it's great to actually have in the person Doug Belshaw, uh, who I consider Mr. Badge, uh, actually speaking to us. So, Doug, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm joking, yes. Um, it's very kind, thank you. Um, so I've just tweeted out a picture of you lot, so you can find yourself in the audience, all that kind of stuff, um, because why not? So, first of all, thank you very much to Ian and to Sharon and to Catherine, everybody involved with this conference for inviting me to speak here. Catherine said for years that I should come to Galway, um, and I'm finally here, only for a fleeting visit, but I do hope to bring my family back. It's such a lovely part of the world. In fact, someone was saying last night that they take the European baseline for air quality from here. Um, which is amazing. What a wonderful place. I'd also like to say hello, Mother, um, who's probably watching me on the live stream. <laughs> and is my biggest fan, so hi, Mum. How are you doing? There we go. Good. Um, so I'm going to just wave my arms about and tell you about some stuff that I'm interested in at the moment. I'll tell you a little bit about me. That's not that interesting. I'm more interested in the stuff that you can do with some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about. For some of you, this will be like not rocket science at all. It will just be very simple. Um, for some of you, it might just provoke an idea. We'll just see how it goes. It's being live streamed, so if you're an avid fan of Periscope, you're very welcome to provide like different angles on what's going on here. You can do that. Um, feel free to have your laptop open, obviously, and do all that kind of stuff. Um, or just sit there and relax and engage and fall asleep. I don't, what's up to you? <laughs> right, first things first. So I have two children. First of all, um, all my, my daughter is four and my son is eight. And they have a big map on their bedroom wall. Um, and they follow wherever I go all over the world. And so I always try and show them where I'm going next. And they didn't know where Galway was. They didn't even know where Ireland was, to be quite honest, which is quite worrying when they know where San Francisco is and those kinds of places. So I showed them on the map where I was going. Um, and, and this is what I got from my son. He said, there's a lot of islands in Ireland, aren't there, Daddy? And I was like, yes, there are. And then his next question was, I wonder if any of them are for sale. <laughs> And so we, we had a look on Private Islands Online, which, if you ever want to waste some time, it's an amazing website. And sure enough, there's one quite close by, which is available for 75,000 euros. So, so there you go. You might, see, you might see me and my family pitching tents there soon, selling up and, and going there. Um, but the things I want to talk to you about today um, are, are these things here in the abstract. I've highlighted some key words, which I think are important. Um, identifying, scaffolding, and credentialing digital skills. Um, the fact that digital literacy is based on the research that I did, this kind of meta-analysis, that they're plural, context-dependent, and socially negotiated, basing on some of the work that uh, Catherine's done as well, um, that we should scaffold these things. We shouldn't just expect people to rock up to our university or educational institution knowing these things. Um, and I want to talk about badge-based learning pathways, which is the current thing that I'm trying to focus on with the clients that I've got. So, who am I? Well, some of you know me best through that picture. When I tried to change that picture, people like, didn't believe it was still me. Um, I don't actually look that much like that picture sometimes, I think. I don't know. Um, but that's me on Twitter. Uh, my backstory, never trust anyone who's never taught. So I have been a teacher. Um, I used to teach history in ICT. I was director of e-learning of the largest academy in England. I then went to work for JISC, who some of you all know. And in fact, I was there on Wednesday, and I'll talk about that in a slide to come. Um, and I focus on those three areas. I then went to Mozilla for three years, and I worked there for, uh, until two months ago on open badges and on web literacy. I was their web literacy lead. Um, and as of two months ago, I'm now a full-time consultant uh, and a gun for hire um, in, in the best of senses. So the things I want to talk to you about today are, are these things. We've already done the introduction. Um, first of all, I want to talk about identifying, but I'll talk about credentialing, scaffolding, 
and then try and wrap things together in some kind of semblance of cohesion at the end. Um, so first of all, this is when I was teaching, um, this must have been about 10 years ago now, um, I had all these kids in front of me, and I'd spent my time learning about history. I did my MA thesis on 19th century Victorian ideas about education. And often the question there with Thomas Henry Huxley, Matthew Arnold, people like that was, what does it mean to be educated in the 19th century? And they came up with all these arguments and things like that. So I was trying to think, well, what does it mean to be educated in the 21st century? What's the difference between these kids in front of me and the kids like 150 years ago? And it seemed to be something around the digital environment being digitally literate. So I was like, okay, well, what does it mean to be digitally literate? That's fine. What actually is digital literacy? And I found the answer, which is wonderful. It didn't take me very long. Digital literacy is whatever you want it to be. <laughs> There's as many researchers, as many definitions of digital literacy as there are researchers in the field. And you can just make up your own definition of digital literacy and defend it at conferences for as long as you want. You can pad out a career um, as long as you want about that. And I think the reason why it's such a contested term is because when we append the word literacy to something, we try and say that this thing is important. Um, so this is a, one of my favorite ever tweets from EdTech Hulk. Hulk think you can put literacy after anything and make people take it more serious. Digital literacy, mobile literacy, Hulk literacy. Um, and it's true, isn't it? If you put literacy afterwards, all of a sudden it has some kind of relevance and meaning. Um, yeah. So instead of trying to come up with one definition to rule them all, you know, some Lord of the Rings style, I thought, well, instead of doing that, how about we come up with digital literacies, kind of a, a plurality of literacies, um, which depend on the different contexts in which you're in. So I've recently got one of those Nest thermostats where you can order, change temperatures and all that kind of stuff. So there's maybe a literacy practice around that, which is different from the very kind of network-mediated world of Twitter. These are all different kinds of spaces. It's not one literacy. It's a series of different literacies. But these literacies are context-dependent, like I said. So you might say, well, there's these set of academic literacies. But even those academic digital literacies might differ between institutions, between um, subjects and domain areas, all those kinds of things. So I think trying to have a very reductionist idea of what digital literacy is is problematic and is pretty indefensible, actually, when I look at the literature. So um, there's that. Um, so what should we do? Should we just give up and say, this is too hard, and spit the dummy out and throw the toys out the pram and go home? Well, no, I suggest we don't do that. What I suggest we do is actually look at the research and try and pull out some of the stuff that we're talking about here in terms of digital skills and digital literacies. So um, this research is probably about three years old now, so I need to pull in some more stuff. But I did this meta-analysis uh, over the six years I was doing my thesis, um, and I looked at loads of different frameworks, from the sublime, like um, Colin, Langshire, um, Colin Langshire and Michelle Noble stuff, amazing, amazing things, to the absurd kind of Microsoft digital literacy curriculum. Sorry if there's anyone here from Microsoft today. It's awful. Um, <laughs> And try to look at what they were talking about. And instead of saying, hey, look, here's a definition of digital literacy, I try to say, well, what would it mean if you wanted to come up with your own definition of digital literacies in your particular context? So here I humbly kind of present eight elements of digital literacies in which you might use to create your own definition. Um, and you might want to negotiate that with other people around you. Um, so you can see, I'm not going to go into these because I want to talk about some other stuff as well. I have got other presentations online where I talk about all these different things. Um, I should have said at the start all these slides are online um, and pointed you to the URL, but I forgot. Um, so cultural, creative, constructive, communicative, confident, cognitive, critical, and civic. As I say, I'm not going to go into those right now, but if you're interested, two things you can do. The first one is free. Um, you can look at my TEDx talk um, where I talk about these things, and you can just search TEDx Warwick Doug Belshaw, and it's there. Um, the other thing, which is cheap, is um, gum.co forward slash digilit, and if you use the code gimme10, you get 10% off. Um, I try to take my thesis, which is available online at neverendingthesis.com, because that's what it felt like at the time. <laughs> I'm sure some people can say amen to that. Um, 
And I try to distill it for teachers. I try not that teachers can't access um, academic work, not at all. More like there's some stuff that you have to put in academic work <laughs> that you would never say if you were down the pub talking to your mates. Um, so try to explain it in much more accessible language, which was immediately kind of applicable. There's one chapter there on ambiguity you can skip over safely, but the rest of it, you know, hopefully will be useful. Um, so talking about that chapter on ambiguity, um, this particular thing is kind of, this, this kind of stuff gets me out of bed in the morning. The fact that the world in which we live in is extremely ambiguous, yet we still manage to negotiate it and, and get around it very easily. So what I'm going to suggest, and I'm going to skip straight on after this, is that when you're trying to deal with anything to do with digital literacies, you're not trying to pin it down too much. You're not trying to make it into a dead metaphor. You're not trying to say that this thing is definitely digital literacies and this thing definitely isn't. Because if you do that, then you end up with just flame wars, people arguing, um, and just not very helpful stuff. So you need some kind of definition and some kind of framework and practices where you've got what I would call productive ambiguity. And this is based on some work by um, Richard Rorty, who talks about dead metaphors and the coral reef in which you can build on top of that. Um, some work by William Emson from the 1930s, who has the best neck beard you will ever see anywhere. Um, and some other work by some people who followed him. Um, if you learn nothing from this talk, go and research William Empson. He had the most interesting life I've ever, ever read. Seriously. Had an awesome neckbeard. Um, so also, um, so Alan, um, Alan Martin talks about digital literacies not really being about a threshold to cross. So not setting a test saying, oh, well, now you're digitally literate, because that would be ridiculous, because new things come along all the time. But it's a condition, it's a way of being, it's an approach, it's a, a way of approaching the world to say that, you know, I'm not, I'm not frightened of what's going to come at me next. It's, a, it's an attitude that you adopt to the digital environment. So I really like that quotation, because it very succinctly, put, succinctly puts the fact that any time you try and come up with a test for digital literacy, you're doing the wrong thing. So when you try and um, work on digital literacies, um, and this is a bit of a whistle-stop tour, work with other people. Don't try and sit in a darkened room with a wet towel over your head thinking very hard. Like, those things don't work. Don't just go and, and take, I don't know, like JISC's definition and just say, oh, well, that is gospel. Don't take, you know, um, Henry Jenkins, who wonderful research, but like, don't just take his stuff and treat it as gospel. Work with other people. Um, don't reinvent the wheel and think about what happens in your context. It doesn't matter if you disagree with the institution down the road, etc. as long as you're thinking through in your context what it means. So co-create definitions of what it is that you mean by things. Definitions are very powerful things. The people who get to name stuff are the people who have power. So if it's the people who are in charge who are naming stuff, they have all the power still. If you, if you create, have everyone coming in together, like with all aboard HE um, stuff, then everybody has the power and a sense of ownership and agency. So some people have taken the work that I did, which was based on other people's work, um, and adopted and changed it. There was a school in the US who decided that actually you could divide, divide these elements between kind of four skill sets and four mindsets, which I thought was a nice development of it. So thinking about the stuff that you can teach people, like click here, press that, don't do that, move that around. Skill sets and mindsets, much more, you have to draw it out of people with the, the, the true meaning of pedagogy. So that was nice. Literally last night, which is why I had to add this slide in, um, a guy called Chris Lott, who teaches um, MED students at the University of Alaska, um, has been using the wiki, which I used to launch my book, he got all of his students on there. I didn't even know he'd done this. Registered all the students on there, and they are critiquing chapter by chapter the stuff that I've written. Some of them are quite harsh critiques as well. <laughs> so I might have to go back and um, write, rewrite some of that. But um, that's a nice thing to do, isn't it? Like taking someone's stuff and then critiquing it and getting back to the author and doing that kind of thing. On Wednesday, um, Helen Beetham, from, who's a consultant with JISC, invited me to a JISC digital capabilities meeting. Now, she had, you might have seen this before, the seven elements of digital literacy, which she'd done before. I used to work with her when I was at JISC, 
Um, and she was going to add one thing onto that and make the eight elements. And I'm kind of like, don't do that, Helen, because then there'll be eight elements that Jiska's done and eight elements that I've done, and no one will pay any attention to my work, and everyone will just go with the Jisk thing. So um, I didn't actually say that to her, but I must have done some kind of inception because she's now taken one away and um, done the six elements. And I really like this model, as I was, as I was saying on Wednesday to her, um, because it puts ICT proficiency almost as a given in the middle or something that you can train up quite easily and then has these overlapping circles all bounded within digital identity and well-being. So I, I really like the way they've done that. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the all aboard HE stuff. Um, there's different ways you can represent this. I've, I've often tried to use a tube map either with my CV or with the stuff that I've done. I've always found it a difficult thing to achieve, so good luck with that. Um, <laughs> and no, not in terms of like it can't be done, just it's an extremely difficult thing to do. But I, I like the wheel, I like the way that it all comes together there as well. So good work so far, like what you've done there. Um, I kind of have to say that, but I think it's a good, it's a good thing. Um, so digital literacies, whistle stop tour. I haven't got enough time to go into all the stuff I've done on that. But I do want to talk very quickly about some stuff I did on web literacy. So if digital literacies has this very permeable membrane around it where you're not really sure what's in and what out, um, I think web literacy is a lot more bounded. So these things are changing as the web develops. But for the purposes of what we did at Mozilla, we kind of said, well, web literacy is everything, is reading, writing, and participating on the web, and the web is going to be everything that you access through a web browser. So we know that there's web technologies built into native apps. We know that there's physical computing and that kind of stuff. But right now, it was 2013-ish. We were just going to focus on the web browser. And this is very much uncharted territory. No one had really done a map or um, a standard around what you need to do to read, write, and participate on the web before. So there was some initial work by Michelle Levesque, and then I took that over um, after about three months. And um, the really powerful thing there was that it was Mozilla. So if you don't know anything about Mozilla, you might recognize the Firefox brand. Mozilla is a global nonprofit, so it exists for the good of the web. Um, and even though I've left Mozilla as a paid contributor, I am still a, con a volunteer contributor. It's the way that it works. It's almost like Wikipedia in that sense, but with a lot more people and, and people involved. Um, and I think that Mozilla is one of the only people who could do this, because if Google did it, or Microsoft, or Facebook, you'd, you kind of think, why are they doing it? Like, there's, a, there's some kind of reason they're doing this for money or whatever. But Mozilla's doing it for the good of the web. They're genuinely interested in how people can get better at these skills. So it's gone through lots of iterations, one of which was extremely colorful, and I enjoyed presenting that one. But version 1.1, which is the last thing I did before I left Mozilla two months ago, um, looks a bit gray. Um, and it looks like this. So exploring, building, and connecting. All of these are competencies like navigation, remixing, participation, privacy, those kinds of things. And they have a list of skills under each one. Now, if I was doing this live, which I sometimes do, um, I would click on all these and show you all the different things. Literally two days ago, my former colleagues made it so that each of these strands, competencies, and skills have its own unique URL. And that's going to be important when we come on to talk about badges because then you can link the badge that you've created to this kind of, this is a standard, and say that, okay, well, a badge in this context in my university or a badge in this context in my after-school program is linked to the Mozilla Web Literacy Map, and you can see how it all comes together like that. So that's at um, a new URL, which is teach.mozilla.org. Um, go and have a look at it. See if there's anything which is missing, and you can be part of the community which brings that on in future if you want to help develop that. So it's a, as the web evolves, it's going to evolve as well. And I much prefer working on web literacy because it's a lot more useful and immediately um, practic practicable than working on a very nebulous kind of digital literacies kind of stuff. Okay. So whistle stop to digital literacies and web literacy. Next, credentialing. So I know a lot of you are interested in open badges. Can I have a quick show of hands? If I say open badges, if that means anything to you at all, could you just raise your hand? Okay, thank you. So that's almost everybody. But I'm not going to just assume that you know anything. I'll, I will go through very quickly. Um, I find open badges fascinating. Like, I think it, it's a Trojan horse for all of the kinds of conversations that we want to have as educators, really. So let me just take you through why I think open badges are powerful, and then I'll talk about some of the applications of that and how you can get started. So 
Digital badges have been around for ages. We've had these as long as the web's been around. So on forums, people have more or less status. So this person is like a, a level 50 on a forum because they go around and help people. And it's, it's a way in which you can show your knowledge and skills, etc., in a digital environment. And we've had those for, what, 20 years? Like ages. But they're really difficult to verify, and they're very easy to copy. If you can right-click and you can copy that image, then you've got that digital badge, and you could pretend that you've got that thing. So it's not hugely trustworthy if you've got a digital badge, which is where Open Badges comes in. So Open Badges has actually been going for about five years now, from its initial idea in a small corner of a pub in Barcelona to, to now. Um, and it's kind of grown over that time, with more and more people becoming aware over it. Um, let me just try and explain what Open Badge is and how it's different from a digital badge. So this image was done by Kyle Bowen, who is, he was at Purdue, and now he's at uh, somewhere else that I'll remember in a moment. But he used to be an illustrator in a previous life, as well as being like director of IT. So he drew this diagram, which is extremely useful, because it shows that behind the digital image is metadata. Metadata just being data about data. When you tag someone on Facebook in that photograph of you roaringly drunk at a wedding last Saturday, um, and you try and untag yourself, you're adding and removing metadata. When you go to the library and you see the Dewey Decimal System, that's metadata. It's all data about data. And that's what we're talking about here. So the name of the badge, um, what you had to do to get it, the criteria, any evidence for that, if it's aligned with any standards like the web literacy map or some kind of national framework, all those things are hard-coded into the badge and unique to the individual earner. So you can't remove them once they're baked in. That kind of it. So if I try to steal Ian's badge for, you know, winging it at the start of a conference when the president doesn't turn up badge, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that because it's his stuff which is encoded into the badge. And it just wouldn't work. So in terms of workflow, this is how it works. This is the diagram that some of you might have seen before, like a napkin sketch. Um, but anybody can issue a badge. And that's the kind of thing that blows some people's minds. Like, surely there must be some kind of quality control, or some, surely you must bestow some kind of badge awarding powers on people. Well, no, you can, anybody can issue a badge for anything. Um, and the earner of the badge gets to choose whether they're going to accept it or whether they're going to reject it. If they reject it, say, no, thank you, I don't want the speaks like a northern idiot badge. Thank you very much. Um, but if I accept it, I have the choice of pushing it to a backpack. Now, up until pretty much this point, there's only been one reference badge backpack, and that's been the Mozilla one. And you take it, and you make an account, and you put it in there, and it's private to you. Now, interestingly, there's a bit of competition now, which is a good thing. So in Finland, there's Open Badge Passport and Open Badge Factory. Um, Pearson have got one with a claim, um, and there's some other ones springing up as well. And I'm advising City and Guilds at the moment on what they can do around badges. So you put this badge in whatever badge backpack you want. And because it's interoperable, you can put them anywhere in any backpack you want. And they're entirely private to you. When you choose to put them together into a collection, you can then embed them pretty much anywhere on the web. It would seem apart from LinkedIn for some reason, because they're like endorsements, because they're so awesome. Um, the endorsements that I get, seriously, like... Seriously, you've never met me, but you're endorsing me for underwater basket weaving. Like, it's just... Um, so, anyway, small. let's rant about LinkedIn later. I'd, I'd very much enjoy a focus group on that. Um, but the, anywhere where you can put arbitrary HTML, anywhere you could embed a YouTube video, you can embed your badges. So on your website, Wiki, um, Blackboard, there's different integrations, Moodle, all that kind of stuff. So there's loads of different badges that people have created. Um, these are just some that's Digital Me, who I've done some work with. Um, they've created, so the Duke of York has a very official royal-looking badge. Look at that. Um, for their IDEA Award. This is like business skills and entrepreneurship. ILM is Institute of Leadership Management, Think Bid and Telefonica. I did the Mozilla badge for the IDEA Award. Yeah, I think they've pulled it now. Um, the Westminster are doing one for learning about law and the House of Commons and, and that kind of thing. And there's fun badges and there's Mozilla badges and there's university badges and there's MOOC badges and there's all these crazy kinds of badges. And the reason why it's so powerful is that anyone create, can create a system of value and a currency within a finite bounded area. So you have towns where they have their own coinage. You have um, 
online courses where they have their own stamps of approval, but they have they struggle to have some kind of value outside of that context. Whereas with open badges, because the entire thing is interoperable and you can move your badges about, they have exchange value within a wider ecosystem. So if you ever read the Richard Scarry books when you were younger, things like, what do people do all day? Which I didn't, but my kids do. You'll recognize this style of drawing. Um, now, someone has just basically taken the piss. Um, and on a Tumblr, welcome to businesstown.tumblr.com, has got new kinds of jobs, not like being a milkman or being a postman, but information architect and new media communications coordinator and some other stuff on the Tumblr, which is a bit too close to the bone to present in front of you today. Um, <laughs> but these are new kinds of jobs where credentials and professional qualifications lag behind the fact that people are doing these jobs, whereas badges are much more faster faster way and a much more agile currency for being able to show that people have skills, verifiable skills and knowledge, which lead to these kinds of jobs. So I'm still waiting for the absolute latest figures, but as of March 2015, there were about 14,000 issuers um, issuing about 2 million badges and about 88,000 backpacks. The reason why the number of backpacks is smaller is obviously because people um, earn multiple badges. But also, there's been a, a real issue around people not being aware that they're supposed to put their badge somewhere. Yeah, so there's, there's the, that kind of tension as well. Um, and I find it difficult when I present numbers how you quantify value. So one badge might have had no meaning to one person. Another badge might have got someone the, career, the, the step in the door for their career that they want, which is why I always put that Dilbert cartoon on there, which, if you can't read, says, I have the ability to quantify the unquantifiable. That is why they call me Dog, Dogbert the Quantifier. Who calls you that? Eight people. Um, so quantifying value is a very difficult thing to do, and I think that Open Badge is done correctly with the right kind of learning design behind it can help with that. So there's lots and lots of people. I couldn't put 14,000 people on one slide, but um, here's some of the stuff around Badge the UK, which is a, some kind of campaign to try and badge the UK. Now, I know I'm an island, but um, you could have Badge Island as well. Badge the world. Badge everything, um, basically. <laughs> Digital Me, who I've already mentioned, they were one of the first winners of the MacArthur Grant, which seed funded the Badgers ecosystem. Um, and they have done all sorts of wonderful work, and I'm working with them at the moment, doing some stuff around badge, canvas, um, learning pathways, that kind of stuff. This one here, if you've ever seen the startup design canvas, like designing your business, this will be familiar. So thinking about how you would design a badge based on things like, well, Who's going to earn it and who's going to endorse it? And how is this badge going to be sustainable within your institution? Like, If you left, would the whole thing crumble? Like, thinking about all these different ideas and, and thoughts. And that's um, downloadable for free from digitalme.co.uk forward slash badge canvas. I highly recommend you take a look at that if you're at all interested in issuing badges. <coughs> Very much whistle-stop tour of badges then. And this is the thing which I'm most interested in at the moment, which is scaffolding. So it's all very well identifying some digital skills and doing that within a particular context. It's all very well having some kind of credentialing system and saying that we can capture those skills. But how do we actually scaffold people's skills so they can get better at stuff? You can't just put people in a room and expect them to get on with it. So I don't play these kinds of games. I'm much more of a FIFA 15 kind of guy. Um, but some people play these kinds of games. And the closest I get to this is Tomb Raider. But this is Path of Exile, a massive multiplayer online role-playing game. I think I've said that right. MM Porg. Um, so this is a skill tree. Now, when I show this to people at the Scottish Qualifications Authority, City and Guilds, any kind of awarding body, they say, well, that's just how we do assessment. Like that's, that's how we level people up. Sometimes they get choices between stuff. Sometimes it's a linear pathway. But this is basically no different from saying that this is a path through an apprenticeship or this is a path through a degree or whatever it is. It, just, it looks very complex. That's what it is. They're doing the same kind of thing. So if you take those little nodes and think of them as like little triples, then um, what you could do is instead of saying, well, at each point on this, this has to be some kind of expert assessment, you could say, well, let's make sure that we do the right kind of assessment for the right stage and where this person's at. So one stage might be self-assessment. Have I done this thing? And if I have, I could even you know, sign off that thing myself. I might be able to do that. Um, then I might ask my peers. So I might ask Ian and Catherine and Sean and other people, you know, do you think I've done this to, the, you know, to, to a good enough job? 
And if I get three out of five, you know, I might pass on to the next level. And then I might go for some kind of expert assessment. And then that kind of triangulation is quite useful for making sure that everybody thinks this learner knows what they're talking about. Now, of course, all those can be badges. So you could self-issue a badge. There's nothing wrong with that because the badge criteria would be, you know, I am awesome badge issued by Doug Belshaw to Doug Belshaw. Um, you'd be able to see the value or, or not in that badge. And then, you know, the peer kind of stuff, you'd be able to see the um, assessment regime behind that. Was it just one other person that said this, this person's done a good job? Or was it 50 people? Or what did this person have to do to get this badge? And then it could be um, an expert as well. And once you've done that, of course, you don't then need to keep those smaller badges. You can issue a badge, a meta-level badge, to capture all of the value within what is a very small learning pathway. So you can say, once that person's got that triangulation, I'm going to issue this meta-level badge, and it captures all of the information inside it. So all of a sudden, you've got learning pathways. You've got the kind of stuff that you were talking about before. And you can build on this. You can build up, and you can build down. You can build... What's the next level beyond this badge? What, I, what do I expect them to go on to next? What are the options? Well, I can build down. I can take that badge, and I can break it into its constituent parts. How granular can I make this learning? Can I do one for turning up? Would that be a valuable thing to do? Well, at a conference, it is a valuable thing to do because I can show my boss that I actually went rather than skived off for the day, that kind of thing. So learning pathways are a useful way of thinking about stuff that we've already done for years. Badges are stuff that we've already done for years. We're just doing it a different way, and we're using different terms. I have the privilege of working with um, a very talented guy called Brian Mathers at the moment. Um, this is one of his diagrams. You might have seen them on Twitter. Um, so Carla Casilli, who works at the Badge Alliance at the moment, she it was a former colleague at Mozilla. She wrote this amazing blog post about uh, pathways and badges and all that kind of stuff. And there was a one particular paragraph at the end that I sent to Brian. I said, look, that just that cries out to be illustrated. And he came up with this, which I think is a beautiful idea of, you know, when, when we had less light pollution and the ancient Greeks looked into the sky and they saw all these different shapes, we as human beings are pattern spotters. That's what we do. We try and make sense of the world around us. So sometimes you see faces in trees. That's because we're, we're trying to spot patterns in the world around us. So trying to think about pathways through learning, some of those might be top-down and hierarchical. Some of those might just be almost desire lines or cow paths. So these are the kinds of things that you see in the countryside when cows or any kind of animals are being are moving from one place to another. And they're never entirely straight lines. They follow the contours of the land, um, and they're sympathetic to the environment. So that means sometimes they can't be replicated elsewhere because the landscape's different. So thinking about desire lines, where people want to go, think about cow paths, how you can be sympathetic to the environment, is a useful thing to do. One of the things I wish I'd done before I left Mozilla was to finish a white paper that I started with Karen Smith. Now, I was hoping Karen was going to finish that paper, and we still might, but she's just left to, she was a postdoc researcher at Mozilla, and she's just gone to, to be a lecturer somewhere in Canada. We were working on this white paper around learning pathways. There's a link there, you can see. It's all, all of Mozilla's stuff's open, and you can see it even when things are half finished. <clears throat> but the, the really nice thing I like, and again, this is building on some of Carla's work, is the difference between prescriptive and descriptive pathways. And I think we're masters of doing prescriptive pathways, of creating things ahead of time and saying, well, to get better, this is what learners have to do. This, this, this. Whereas a descriptive pathway, on the other hand, is when a learner has already reached their goal and you go back and you say, these are all the things that you have done, and that might turn into a prescriptive pathway for someone else. So one of the examples which... Um, I probably should put in here is the Digital Youth Network, who, even before open badges existed, thought about how you could capture and credential a course which they were all already offering through their iRemix platform. So what they did was they, um, they, they took this particular girl who'd spent two years working with them after school around photography and digital media, and she'd got some kind of like graduation thing at the end of the two years. But they took her entire activity through the iRemix platform over two years, and they broke it down and said, well, if, I, if you're going to get a badge for all of these different things, it would probably look like this. So, you know, level one photographer, level two 
you know, media capture, whatever it is, and doing all these different kinds of badges, then presenting that to her and said, would that have been a useful thing to do at the time when you were learning? Would it have been useful to have got a level one badge there? You know, and she'd say, oh, yes, that's useful. Or, you know, I didn't actually want anyone to know about that. Or, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a badge, which is, there's any point in that badge. So giving, talking to learners about what they've already done and how a badge system could develop on the learning that's already happened, which might be useful for capturing the learning that's going to happen for the next cohort of learners. So thinking about the difference between prescriptive and descriptive pathways might be a useful thing to do. Okay, just to finish off then. So I've talked about capturing digital skills very briefly, and I've pointed you to some other resources and some further reading. Um, I've talked about credentialing and open badges, and there's a whole wealth of resources. If you just type in um, into Google or DuckDuckGo or your favorite search engine, um, open badges Google group, there's a wonderful community of people who you can just introduce yourself to, even as a complete newbie, and say, I'm interested in doing this stuff. They'll connect you with people all around the world. And there's some, you know, the luminaries of the, of the open badge movement um, in that group. And then scaffolding, I very briefly talked about ways in which we don't have to be top-down and prescriptive, and we don't have to um, go ahead of time exactly what's going to happen with learners' progression and pathway. I've talked about ways in which we might match assessment rigor to the learning activity rigor as well. So learners are already doing their own thing. We don't have to kind of put a barrier in the way and say, oh, well, actually, to level up to this, you have to do this thing here. We can kind of follow what they're already doing. And I, I love this image because it kind of shows the difference between you know, bad design and good user experience. And there's another wonderful one where there's just lots of grass and a barrier, and cars have just driven around it as well. Like, why wouldn't you? It's, it's like speed humps on the road where I live. Nobody goes over them. Everyone drives around them. Like, why would you bother dealing with the barriers that are in your way to learning when there's other ways of doing stuff? Um, the final thing I'd say is that, going back to what I said before, if you want to go fast on stuff, go alone. Like, do just sit by yourself and just nail something and knock something out. If you're under pressure on a deadline, that's the best way of doing stuff. But if you want to go far and you want something which is sustainable and going to work for a long time with a lot of learners, then go together. Bring people together. Find ways to bring people together to talk about stuff. So bearing that in mind, let's work together. You can hire me. Um, <laughs> I had to put that one in there. But also ask me hard questions. I was talking to some people over there before. Easy questions are no good. Hard questions are the ones that you need because hard questions challenge people's thinking, make people slightly uncomfortable, but that's good because it means that people are learning and thinking about what it is that's, that's going on. So there's my contact details. Um, grab me later, softly, not hard. Um, and the Badge Alliance is the non-profit organization to coordinate the kind of badge ecosystem if you're interested in that as well. So thank you very much, and I'm interested in your hard questions. Thank you.